scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, and who bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on course at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you.
that is because many people are more interested in walking in it than studying it. And so many people have experiences captured within their Christian life that they cannot explain. They cannot give meaning. They just know that people fall down in my meetings. People shout. I feel fire in my hands. I feel cold. I just know it is from the Holy Spirit. And yet, because we do not give attention to study these things, there is hardly mastery as far as the operation of the anointing is concerned in our lives. Please, when the power of God comes upon that lady outside, um, I want you to bring her in. I want to speak and I want to prophesy. In the name of Jesus Christ. I'm seeing light just casting on this side. And this. Please hold on. We're going to pray. And it's an impartation. It's a grace for the prophetic just on this road. Please bring them out and sing a grace for the prophetic. God wants to shift people into very strange dimensions in the spirit. Please bring them out. You will never be the same. Shalas kobranda gadosia. For some of you, what you saw in your dreams are about happening. You've seen them in dreams and visions. Will you open up the gates? Open up the doors. Will you open up the gates? is opening to someone in the spirit. Open up the gates. Salida la hasala baruti asala. My dear, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. The Spirit of God is saying, Behold, I do a new thing. Please be careful with her. Don't drag her. In the name of Jesus, I declare for you and for your loved ones, the old is rolled away like the curtain. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I cast away every spirit that impedes your growth and your advancement in this kingdom. I declare you are delivered now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Bring the people laughing in the spirit. It's not just some religious gibberish. It is an operation of the spirit that I'm hoping at the end of this conference we will understand. It's a laughter in the spirit. Please bring them. The power of God come upon them in the name of Jesus Christ. hallelujah just be patient with me a minute and we'll be seated the Bible says the shouts of joy and victory shall not depart from the tent of the righteous let me prophesy to someone here. In the name of Jesus, I come tonight by the rod of a higher priesthood that every challenge that has stood before you, in the name of the Lord God whose I am, it will fall like Dagon before the act tonight. It will fall like Dagon before the act tonight. Hallelujah. Ebenezer. Who is Ebenezer? Ebenezer, you're wearing a blue and a cream shirt. Blue and cream. No, blue and cream. It's like a short shirt. There is a blue patch and cream. Who is that? What is your name? Ebenezer. You're a member of this church? 
I want to pray for you. My friend, you love Jesus. The spirit of prayer and supplication is coming upon you. I stretch my hands. May that grace come upon you. Let it take you to untold dimensions in the spirit. In the name of Jesus, you receive of that grace. You will never be the same. My friend, I want to pray for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the Lord revealed me to you and I'm speaking to you for you and for your family. January is a season of strange breakthrough for your family. I release that grace upon you right now in the name of Jesus Christ and that everything that stands between you and prophecy, I clear it out of the way. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. The healing anointing. I don't know you, this gentleman. You are a man of God. Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, the Lord is telling me that he's introducing you to a dimension of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you will experience the healing power of Jesus in a strange way. Father, in the name of Jesus, a new grace, fresh dimension in the Spirit. Let this unction rest upon you and turn you into a sign and a wonder. Please be seated. God bless you. Psalm 92 and verse 10. Let's see how the Lord will help us. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Grant us illumination by the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Conferences like these are opportunities by the grace of God to expose the body of Christ to dimensions of the kingdom. The kingdom is built and is made up of systems and God mandates that we study these operations one by one so that we can gain mastery and that our Christian lives will become fruitful and productive. It is for this cause that he gave unto some apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers for the maturing of the saints. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 tells us that we are all called. Every believer in Christ is called. Please give it to us. The Bible says... Who had saved us and called us with an holy calling. So every believer in Christ is called. For as long as you have been grafted into Christ through the experience of the new birth, the Bible says that you are called. You are called. It's an initiation into a life of victory, a life of purpose, a life that represents the Christ himself. Second Peter 1 and verse 10 tells us that we are not only called but we are chosen. And then it says that it is within our responsibility to give diligence. Look up please. To make your calling and make your election. The word election is still the word chosen. Are we together now? That it is within your power and it is your responsibility to make both your calling, the validity that you are called and the validity that you are chosen, that you, please keep that scripture there, to make your calling and your election sure. So on one side it tells us that we have been called and it says it's a holy calling. But that not everyone, even though called, will walk in the fullness of the purposes of God. Are we together now? So we establish the fact that we are called in Christ. But here scripture is saying, give diligence. Brethren, he's speaking to people who are in Christ. Give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. That means if you do not give diligence to certain things... It will cause men to justifiably doubt whether you are called. Are we together? 
This is true for a man of God. This is true for a businessman. That you can live your Christian life in a way and a manner that justifies being questioned. That people say, where is your God? These propositions that you give about God, are they real? The Bible says it is your responsibility to be a validator. To make sure no one doubts you in your lifetime. That the hand of God is upon your life. That no one doubts you in your lifetime. That it is true the Holy Spirit is at work in you. That no one doubts you in your lifetime. Time, that the word of God is alive and strong in you. He calls it giving diligence to make your calling and your election sure. You can be called as a preacher and ignoring these things, the matters that make for validation of your ministry. People will look at you and say, is it true that you are called? No power, no grace, no revelation, no results, no nothing. Christ is hardly glorified in and through your life. If it is true that we are called, if it is true that you are born again, if it is true that the Holy Spirit lives in you, if it is true that the word of God is alive, quick, powerful in your spirit, if it is true that you have been planted in the house of God, then the results that follow these things should happen in your life and the bible says if it does not happen it is your fault it says there is something you must do as a responsibility in fact jesus himself was teaching in what we call the beatitudes one of his mentorship sessions and he said let your light so shine permit your light the results the fruit of your dealings in the spirit that let it so shine before men that they, the men, might see your good works to the end that they will glorify your Father in heaven. That means there is a dimension of glory God cannot receive from the life of a believer who does not command certain notable dimensions of results. It is more than just showing that you are anointed. It is more than just showing that you are of God. There has to be a testament of the life, the power, the grace of God upon you. This has nothing to do with ministry. You are making your calling and your election show. Are we together? That means you should not blame members when they say, where is your God? When the sick come back and go back sick. When the oppressed come back and go back oppressed. When the broken come back and go broken, that they have a right, according to this scripture, to doubt your call. Are you getting what I'm saying now? That it is, they have a right to say, if you say where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. Where is he? We are more than three here. Listen, I'm challenging you tonight to come into a Christian experience that is provable. The times that we live in now will no longer allow noise and stories of a God who was and a historic God. We need to be able to demonstrate the reality of this life that we so propose. We've said so many things about God in conferences, in conventions. There are so many advocacies about who he is and what he can do. And then the world is standing in their arrogance and waiting and saying until you can demonstrate the validity of all you are talking we consider you noisemakers, philosophers, they say. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus came to the temple and the scroll of Esaias was given to him where he wrote the messianic prophecy, Isaiah 61. Jesus speaking that scroll, he began to read it before them. That the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said. For he hath anointed me to preach glad tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, he said. To deliver them that are in bondage. He said all those things. I'm quoting that scripture and this guy is getting delivered. Now this one is the power of God. This is not a sermon. When he was done, he said, this day... Is this scripture fulfilled? And he saw a woman with a withered hand and said, if it is true that I am the Messiah that is talked about, let that reality be here and now. Madam, stretch forth your hand. The Bible says that the Greeks seek for a sign. Have you read that scripture? That we live in a time where men and women will not just believe for nothing. 
there has to be a dimension of the reality of God. There is too much speaking, too much speaking, not teaching, too much speaking propositions of what God can do. God can do. We whet the appetite of people like the fig tree and we cause them to come and they come there with nothing. God is able to change your life, we say. I'm not being sarcastic. God is able to lift you and many times we are well-meaning. We don't mean to deceive them. We are sincere but we go back and say, God, but why? What is this? What is this? I gave my best. I called for a healing meeting. I called the sick to come. They waited from morning till night. And they went back. I called sinners to come. I told them there is a savior that can save. And while I was teaching what I believe the Bible says is the power of God unto salvation. That while that teaching is going on, the sinners were watching like this, unconverted, untouched by the message. We propose that as believers and as men of God, he has put something in our lips. That when we utter words upon the lives of people, we can create a system of blessing upon them. But how many times do we continue to speak? The Lord bless you. The Lord lift you. May your life change. They say amen, meaning they believe, but they don't return with results. Can I tell you this? There has to be a dimension of the grace of God that must be displayed in the land of Asaba to bring principalities and powers. Hear what I tell you. There has to be a dimension of the reality of the spirit that you will see people on the streets, conversions, a, 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 an effulgence of power that on Sunday the streets and the shops are closed because men and women will have to go to God there is, there is a dimension of the power of the Spirit of God. He said, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellency of speech. Because the morale is not to show you I'm a great orator, but to demonstrate to you that there is a kingdom that is provable here and now. Why should I not go to a harbor list when I'm desperate for a solution and you told me that I should stay and go to God and I'm staying to God while my loved one is dying listen we have no right to question the alternatives until we demonstrate the authentic right now it looks like a mockery when you say you are in ministry when you say you are a man of God this is what society interprets I am a nuisance to civilization I am a nuisance to intellectualism I am a nuisance to, to sociological development we are this group of religious bigots that have come to interrupt status quo when has it been that the church is said that you are the light of the world. That means the definition of darkness is a territory without the church. When a man of God comes to a house and knocks and says, peace be unto you, the people in the house are already offended because in their mind they feel this, this money grabbers have come with their false and negative prophecies to mislead us and collect money. Oh, come on, please. That there is a dimension of grace that as you are knocking at the door of someone without knowing what the problem is, the spiritual climate that you carry is announcing something to the realm of the spirit that the age-long captivity that that family is under should go. Can I tell you this? The lifetime of transformation, when you see Jesus, you need only one encounter. There were a few times in scripture where people had to encounter him twice to be transformed. One solid, genuine encounter. Please sit down. So the Bible says we are called. Everybody say, I am called. You are a believer in Christ according to the authority of scripture. It says you are called. 
is a holy calling the Bible says but then the Bible says just proposing that you are called will not bring God glory and that our lives will continue to be barren like the fig tree then he says give us that scripture again first Timothy second Timothy second Peter sorry one and verse 10 it says wherefore help us second Peter one and verse 10 media wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make now women understand this when they say make rice that means take responsibility and bring together the ingredients if I say madam make for me fried rice the first assignment of that woman is to go to the market was that not what he said go and buy from them that sell that means there are people that sell it if, if you are desperate enough there are men who have been custodians of that dimension you seek the parable of the ten virgins he said go the one we have is not enough go to the market there are people who sell it buy from them you don't buy with money you buy with meekness you buy with honor you buy with discernment that you can carry the currency of meekness the currency of honor the currency of discernment to say I discern that you are one of the privileged stewards that has been given this to sell to give to make available so he says make your calling and your election sure man of God make your calling and your election sure believer make your calling that means when this word comes your first assignment is what are the ingredients required to make this ministry potent oh God you called me into a prophetic ministry every prophecy I've given people said is a lie I must go back to the drawing room in the spirit what are the graces what are the dimensions of light I need to form that ministry to make my calling and my election sure You've called me to be a kingdom financier. There is a dimension of kingdom wealth I do not know. My life continues to represent failure even though I am called. So when men doubt your call, don't be afraid. Their, 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 their doubt should push you to go back and say, Lord, these people are justified until my results prove otherwise. Are we blessed? Lord, you have called me to demonstrate the reality of the spirit to a territory. And yet darkness continues to loom across that territory even with my presence. That means I need to go back to the drawing board in the spirit with the assignment to make my calling and my election sure. Don't forget this message tonight. It's a message that cultures responsibility. That waiting for God to just anoint you arbitrarily, waiting for prophecy to find its way to happen, you will wait forever. You have to take responsibility tonight and say in the name of Jesus, I will find whatever the ingredients are. I will pay that price. Go and buy from them that sell. Go and buy from them that sell. There are stewards who have been given this assignment. Hallelujah. You have malls within your town. And when you want to buy household products, you don't go to a carpenter. For instance, when you want to buy food ingredients, there are people who sell food. And sometimes you are even fortunate they have a place designated already to make it easy for you. When you go to ShopRite or any of your malls, they, they even label it for you to make your search easy. That if what you want, uh, beverages and so on and so forth, there is a plethora of them for your choice. That means if your calling and your election is not sure, is accredited to pride, lack of discernment, lack of meekness, and maybe sheer laziness. Every dimension of grace, every dimension of revelation we seek to represent Christ to his fullness is available within the body but it does not come to you you search the proof of passion is pursuit that when you are passionate about a dimension and a thing you seek it 
I believe in the name of Jesus that your coming and your sacrifice to sit in and outside is proof that you are tired of your current level and that you desire something that is real and provable to come upon your life. I believe that the, the, the Holy Spirit is in partnership with our bishop and the men and women of God within this city to say Maranatha, let a new dimension of glory come. Let a new dimension of power come. Let a new dimension of the investment of the Spirit upon this land come. Come Lord Jesus. Come. Come revival. Come. Come signs and wonders. Come. Come salvation. Come. Come baptisms. Come. Come revelation and spiritual intelligence. There has to be a people. It is the Spirit and the bride that says come. It is not only the spirit alone. The spirit can say come and the bride in Asaba is refusing to echo that same word. When the spirit says come, the bride must also say come. The spirit and the bride say come. Are we blessed? So this conference is an attempt to bring to our lives one of the major ingredients that can help a believer make his calling and his election sure. Now, does it, does it make sense to you what I'm teaching? Because just teaching about the anointing arbitrarily is what has produced the immaturity that we see in the body of Christ today. Because people have access to dimensions of grace without purpose. They do not even know to what end it is. So there, there is a, a display and a galore of flesh. But when we connect these teachings to kingdom come and to a bigger spiritual cause, then you now see that your desiring the anointing has now come under alignment to a greater cause to see Christ revealed, to see Christ glorified, more than just making a name. That Lord, I love you so much. I want to see your life and your glory lifted and, and, and revealed within my territory. According to Galatians 1.24, that man will glorify God in me. And because of that agenda, to prove to creation that you are God, to be a witness indeed, a validator of your power, your grace, is for that reason that I seek the anointing. It is for that reason that I fast. It is for that reason that I pray. Because I love you and I want to see creation give you glory. That it will not be in my lifetime that people will say, where is this God? The anointing. When Jesus began to mentor the disciples, isn't it amazing, men of God, that when you read the Gospels, you will hardly, aside from the recitation of the Messianic prophecy, you don't hear the mention of the anointing there. You don't even hear the mention of spiritual power. There are few times Jesus talked about that because the major ingredient was to supply spiritual knowledge. He knew that introducing them to the anointing would destroy them. And so he kept them to mentor them. Because the anointing reflects your level of spiritual illumination. When you get the anointing and your mind is not transformed, the, the way you will operate will make it look as though it's the anointing making you behave that way. And yet it is lack of transformation. So the more transformed you are, the more you are giving the anointing space to find expression. Are we blessed? The anointing. What is the anointing? Let's define it and then we'll just share a few things. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 10 27 Isaiah 10 27 please give it to us media help us and it shall come to pass in that day someone say this is that day that his burden shall be taken from off your shoulder read with me please 
and his yoke from off thy neck. Uh -huh. And the yoke shall be destroyed because that when you introduce something to that yoke, the yoke will be destroyed. The yoke does not get destroyed on its own. But there is a spiritual factor that when you introduce to that yoke, the Bible says the yoke is destroyed and the reason is because of the anointing. Please write this down. The anointing is a system of ordination and authorization. The anointing is a spiritual system of ordination and authorization. You may want to write the anointing legitimizes your representing God on earth. The anointing has nothing to do with oil necessarily. The anointing has nothing to do with touching people's head. The anointing is a spiritual system that was invented by the intelligence of God as a system of ordination legitimizing your representing him on earth so that all the powers of darkness and indeed creation will respond to you because they know that you are operating on legal grounds you were authorized so he says the spirit of the lord is upon me because he had ordained me he had authorized my operation hallelujah you have I saw a few security people outside. When a military man wears his uniform, that uniform is a system of authorization. Is that true? It legitimizes him. You don't find a military man in his uniform holding a rifle and then you question him because the uniform permits that he holds a rifle. But when you just see an ordinary man like that, you have to go to the court of law to verify whether that territory allows the use of rifles. So when you walk to creation and say, sick, be healed. Blind eyes, open. Destinies be transformed. Believers, I supply you light. The realm of the spirit will ask you back, where is your authorization? Because as, as creation, we were designed to obey, but not obey everyone. We obey people that carry a badge of authorization. And we see this in Jesus. We see this in Paul, but all oh, sons of Sceva, where is your authorization? So it's not just enough to speak. It's not just enough to do ministry. The anointing, therefore, is God's way of legitimizing your operations on earth. God's way of legitimizing your representing him. Are we together? And the Bible tells us, theologically speaking, that there are two dimensions of the anointing. The first, according to scripture, sorry I'm rushing because I want us to close on time. First John chapter 2 and verse 27. It is called the anointing that is within you. It says, but the anointing which you have received, that means you were not born with it. You have received. Of him abided in you and ye need ye need not that any man teach you do you know what that means look up please that there is an anointing you receive that becomes an authorization for the Holy Spirit to carry out his ministry in your life and build you when you read Isaiah 61 is a very interesting rendition that many of us may not have paid attention to. It says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. So when you read it well, you will say because he has anointed me, the spirit of the Lord has now come upon me. Are you getting the word now? It is not just that the spirit of the Lord brought the anointing, that there was an authorization that allowed him on legal grounds to come to my life. And the Bible says that one of those anointings is the anointing within and that the assignment please keep that scripture that the assignment of that anointing is to make sure 
that you are enlightened spiritually. That that anointing is responsible for delivering to you all of the spiritual packages that are responsible for your personal growth. This is not the anointing for ministry. This is not the anointing for your office. It is because of this anointing that you can place a demand and say, let scripture be open. There is an anointing within you that is responsible for your growth. Back to the scripture, please help us. It says that what the anointing teaches you is true. So it is an anointing within you that, that drives you to fast for three days. And you are just fasting. It is part of your spiritual growth processes. There is an anointing within you that compels the Holy Spirit to drive you to go to church to come for fellowship. I was glad when they said to me, there is an anointing that causes that gladness. Are we together? But the second dimension of the anointing, the investment of God's power, that it comes upon you and it is primarily to equip you for kingdom service. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power, he says, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And that power that comes upon you will make you witnesses, validators. It will make you prove the reality of my existence. Witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Please give us Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. In Judea, in Samaria it says, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That is the anointing that comes upon you and empowers you to represent the purposes of Christ as a businessman, as a student, as a minister of the gospel, as a politician, one in government. It doesn't matter what is the geography of your assignment. That when the power and the anointing that is upon you, it legitimizes your operation. You can represent the purposes of God in its fullness. The anointing is responsible for results in the life of a believer. Please understand this. When you find believers that produce uncommon results in their personal spiritual growth and as far as representing the purposes of God are concerned that there is an unction, there is an anointing from heaven. In fact, in ancient times, you never sent anyone to do any assignment for the kingdom. Remember, again, you find it in Exodus. You find it in Leviticus again and again. Call Aaron and call his sons and anoint them. Every time God found a man to use him, he would use the priest or the prophet to anoint that person through the medium of oil. That when that oil comes upon that person, the spirit of God will come. And empower that person to walk in supernatural dimensions. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the anointing for your destiny will locate you this night and rest upon your life and turn you into a sign and a wonder. Now please sit down. The anointing is responsible for efficiency in this kingdom. You cannot be efficient until the requisite level of the anointing is upon you. God has called you into a ministry. You cannot be efficient until the requisite level of the anointing comes upon you. God has called you into business and finances. You cannot be efficient until the requisite level of grace is upon you. Look at me please. When you see people do uncommon things, it is because there is a dimension of grace that is not given to men or not fabricated by men that is upon them. You may want to write this definition of the anointing, therefore, that the anointing is God's ability. A second definition. The anointing is God's ability at work 
in a human or material vessel, God's ability at work in a human or material vessel causing that vessel to produce God's dimension of results. God's ability at work in a human or material vessel causing that vessel to produce God's dimension of results. Are we together? As a normal human being, you cannot speak to someone and say, in the name of Jesus, go, return with a result. You don't have that power as a human, as a, as a natural man. It is not given to you. But there is an engracing from heaven that can come upon you. And when you speak, it's as though it is God speaking. And because he's the one who has empowered you, he will back what you have said and ensures that the people return with the results as spoken. Genesis 21 and verse 1. Please give it to us. Genesis 21 and verse 1. Let's read it together if we can see it. Genesis 21 and verse 1. Please read with me. One to read. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Uh -huh. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. So he said it and then he did it. The anointing is the doing agency of the spirit. That is more than just saying it. When you say it, there is an agency that goes to work. That anointing. That God speaks to you and says, in the name of Jesus, I will give you your space, Rehoboth, within this city. And when he speaks, the anointing moves and begins to shift systems and structures until that which was spoken. The anointing has an assignment to ensure. Do you know, the anointing is like a messenger. The word of God carries it. The word of God is like a tray. A tray does not carry it. And you are wondering, this is a hundred year captivity over that family. It's because you are looking at yourself, oh warm Jacob. But there is an ability from heaven that can rest upon you. And you go as one sent that I am a messenger. Press before the invitations start coming. Press before the crusades start coming. Don't experiment when you're on stage. Men are too impatient to give you a second chance. Go back to the secret place. Do your homework. That when you come out in the spirit and the power of God, you will be able to validate the reality of the life and the power of God. I am grateful to God today with all humility that he granted me the patience to stay until he came. Listen, please don't be offended. This anointing thing, Ba, if it's there, it is there. If it is not there, it's as simple and honest as that. When you ask a woman who is a chef, Madam, please make fried rice. All she needs from you is time. Guarantee that that meal is coming. If you ask me now to cook for you, as anointed as I am, uh, there is going to be a discussion between me and God this night. <laughs> we'll have to walk around angels to come and help me. After all, they made bread. So they, 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 can, they can walk around and cook. But in my own strength, whatever you see there, you just take it. Because there is no mastery. I have not paid the price to gain mastery in that area. But you come to any of our mothers and say, mothers, we want to eat this tomorrow. They start laughing. You never see them say, I hope we'll not, the people will not. The issue of disappointment is out of the, the question. This is what I want you to get into in the spirit. That you can get to a point where when people come to meet you, when they see you as a man of God, they start rejoicing. Because they can say in the name of Jesus, we know that this challenge truly has come to end. Hallelujah. A man of God once packaged a seed to sow into my life. And I told him for what? He said for increase. 
I said, if you don't rise, come back and collect your money. Because that would be a scam. That would be that I cheated you. If you actually carry your seed believing that I'm a representative of the kingdom and you sow it and you go back and nothing happens, I deceived you. Come back and collect your money with honor. The anointing is in levels and the anointing is in dimensions. I may not have all the time to teach everything, but I need to say this so that we'll start praying. Please listen. The anointing is in levels. That means two people can have the same kind of anointing, maybe a healing anointing or a prophetic anointing, but it is in levels. Are we together now? Ezekiel 47, that he took me and showed me a river that came from the north of the, the east side of the temple and he began to list levels the similitude of the anointing that means that means that a number of people can be called into the same operation but the level they have pressed into i wish i had time to walk this please one person come any one person look at this everybody look at this if this brother has god forbid say a cause in his life okay and this guy is suffering from delay and this guy is suffering from sickness are we together and this guy is suffering from oppression there is need for breakthrough how many of you know that he needs the power of god in his life is that true now if i come as a man of god pastors lend this this is a, a big revelation if i meet this person i will tell him in the name of jesus be free from that oppression now watch this every dimension of problem in his life has a level of anointing that takes it away so while you are praying generically are we together now the anointing that is upon you through the problems in his life and only solves the one that is within his level for instance please you have to understand this let's assume I want to use monetary value so that we can understand. Let's assume that this man has 1,000 naira worth of the anointing. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Just for. And he has a problem of delay. And that problem of delay will require a 50,000 naira worth of the anointing. And as a man of God, I come with 3,000 naira worth of anointing. Now, I am anointed while I pray for him. The only problems that will be solved in his life are the problems that are below my level of anointing. This is the mystery behind certain conditions that seem not to change. Every challenge is at the mercy of the level of grace that confronts it. This is why although you are anointed, God still says rise higher because as more members are coming, the challenges that they are bringing, your current level of grace may not be able to solve it. So he said, grow, he said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. You know the kind of anointing you carry by the testimonies that recycle in your life. There are certain testimonies that just does not seem to happen. But when you contend in the secret place, suddenly newer dimensions of results and upgrade has happened to you in the spirit. And when God wants to lift you higher, he will organize conferences like this. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end. My goal is your establishment. Hallelujah. And part of the apostolic and prophetic ministry is vested by grace through the election of grace. Are we together now? To supply to the body of Christ and to territories the dimensions that are either missing or weak as far as their establishment is concerned. So it is part of the apostolic ministry by the Spirit to scan through a territory and see the graces that are absent or the graces that are not in sufficiency. And then by the supply of the Spirit, provide that dimension so that the testimonies that were not heard will now be heard. If this does not happen, we only waste our time in conferences. Are we blessed? So after conferences like this, 
we hear that fire is burning in church A and demons move to church B for refuge. Before they get there, fire is also burning there. It's like beacons of fire. This is how you drive spirits out of a territory because spirits don't leave a territory. They move from a place of comfort to a place of comfort. When every place is on fire, they will have no option than to leave. So you will find out that certain widespread vices suddenly begin to leave. A particular region, smoking for instance, prostitution or whatever, and you find out that after a while, these spirits move to a, another region. And you find out that that region is already manifesting those qualities. Young men who were not seen to smoking before, suddenly the devil gets one envoy and he begins to initiate others. Then suddenly another kind happens. But when there is fire burning, all of a sudden you will hear that, ah, the police has arrested a group of thugs that disturb a territory. Sanity is now returning. And you hear that there are prayer groups that are rising. Young boys who just feel, let's be spending three hours on Thursday praying. Can you join me? They are not just moving themselves. It's the spirit of revival upon the land. The, the group does not have a name. They don't even know what they are doing. They just stand behind a tree and pray like madmen. Something is happening because there are anointings and graces that have now found expression in the land. It is God's desire that Asaba becomes a reflection of his grace and power. Listen, the spiritual and sociological quality of a land is a reflection of the quality of the vessels within that land. It is true. There is an anointing. I remember years ago, and, and I say this respectfully, I used to pray for certain conditions in people and it would not change. I, I really felt bad as a man of God, not because of my ego. I remember it was terrible. I would pray for people maybe with HIV, cancer, or something like this. And even me, I know nothing happened to them. You know, sometimes you have to be very honest. It's, it's not that you are prophesying negative on yourself. There were issues that when I saw, I knew this, this was a dumb deal. Go. I saw innocent mothers come and say, Apostle, please, our family has this challenge. And, and I was empathetic and I prayed in the name of Jesus, may your problem. And they believed. They were crying. They even sowed seed in my life. But the truth is that I saw them many months and maybe years and nothing had changed in their life. I had to go back to say, Lord, I know that I'm sincere. But sincerity is not the only seed for transformation. You need genuine power. And then the Lord began to teach me that the anointing is in levels. So when you stay with him and grow in that level, no wonder Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says, how God, not that he anointed Jesus, look at the extent, so that every problem he confronted was below the level of his grace. Look, let me tell you, you want to see how cheap Satan is? find a high level of the anointing and you will watch it rubbish darkness in your presence believe me I had the privilege to have met a few revivalists in this nation and then around the world and I remember one time I traveled his now late of blessed memory prophet Kobus van Rensburg I remember going to his church in still Fontaine in South Africa and I saw something that surprised me there. I saw that within the span of six to seven years he had raised 10,000 wheelchairs and crutches single-handedly more than the wealth revival combined. One man. He would not solve your financial problems. He would not solve other major problems but when it had to do with the miraculous I saw dimensions of grace. I read about Charles and Francis Hunter, both of blessed memory. In one single service, they raised 100 wheelchairs. Not stage managed. 100 real people seated. 
I watched Renard Bonke crusades. I saw the supernatural power of God. It was not fake. I saw people who I know how they came. And he began to challenge me. I said, Lord, I don't want to be that kind of preacher that will continue to talk without demonstrating the reality of this. And I made up my mind that if the problems and the challenges of people were real, then we must contend for a real level of grace. And can I tell you, up till today, I have remained a student of growth in the spirit. I continue to challenge myself in the spirit to rise to higher dimensions of the anointing because principalities and powers must totally come. We, we need to get to levels like Elijah and, and like Joshua where you can speak to territories and they will answer, not just bodies. Son, stand still. Elijah looked at a territory and said, there shall be no rain except at my word. I hope you know there were other people who believed in the God of the Bible. And I'm sure somehow they prayed too and said, God, forget about this arrogant prophet. Just send rain. But God said, someone with a level of grace at a territorial level has done business in the spirit and locked up the heavens. Hallelujah. Can you lend me five minutes? Just for tonight, we'll finish up in the morning. But I don't just want to flatter you with the realities of the anointing. You came here not just to hear but to receive. Are we together now? There is a price for the anointing. Sit down please. And this is where I want to respectfully caution that we need to be careful when we begin to carry this proposition around the body of Christ as though there is no price for anything. Believe me, there is a price. There is a real price to host God. There is a price to carry the anointing for a generation. You want your words to become like the word of God. You want to have access to revelation and illumination. There is a price. You want the anointing that comes upon your life to shift systems and structures. There is a price. Hallelujah. Pray in one minute and say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes. To see that price that I must pay in the spirit. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty is mighty in battle. Amen. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. From just being a believer to my son. The first prize is in the first two words of that scripture. My son, I no longer call you strangers. That he brings you to that point of intimacy. My son. Let me show you a scripture that I pray you will never forget. John chapter 14, please. From verse 21 and then 23. But let's look at 21. This is a vow and a promise that Jesus gave. It's a scripture I found many years ago and it changed my life. 14, 21, John. Please give it to us. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he says, He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Go to verse 23. Same scripture. 23. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him and we will come to him. This is the secret to the manifestation of the power and the glory of God. You've been crying for a visitation. Here is the formula. We will come to him and make our abode with him. 
So back to our scripture, Proverbs 23. My son. That means you must come near. I don't want to deal with you as a stranger. This is a family affair. My son. My son means you must acknowledge me as Abba. Your source. Your sustainer. Your defender. Only a father will call someone a son. A stranger cannot call someone a son. If I call you son, that means I am father. So when God says my son, it's an acknowledgement that my fatherhood over you is not in doubt. I have studied your life and I have seen that you have come to a place where you have acknowledged me as Alpha and Omega. You have acknowledged me as the beginning and the end of your life. You have acknowledged me as your source, your sustainer, your life force, my son. You want power with God. You're not going to rush and visit God. You see, the thing with the thing with superstitious people and herbalists is that they don't need a relationship to bless you. You can go to a herbalist and you don't need his name. He just comes and says, what is your problem? Period. My problem is that I need money. And he says, all right, go and bring a cow. Go and bring a, whatever, maybe chicken. Go and bring this. You don't need to know his name. He doesn't need to know your name. If he calls your name, it's not because he loves you. He's giving you word of knowledge to make sure you trust him. Are we together? But when you come to God, the anointing is a derivative of intimacy. He does not just say, oh, take power and go. Uh-uh. My son, I want a relationship first. Not ministry. Not power. This is where many people fail. Because when we come to God, we are not interested in a relationship. Oh Lord, I need power. That's all I need. I want to park stadiums and lift people from wheelchairs. And that's all I want. And God says, is this how much I mean to you? My son, I want to bring you to a place of intimacy. Abba, source. If this gentleman is my son and I find him eating my food, even if he has done something wrong, the fact that he's my son, there, there is already, I'm vulnerable to him already. Are we together now? I can just say, okay, next time don't do that, but you concentrate. And he can even tease me and say, you are the only father that I have. If you like, kill me. And what is supposed to be a thing of tension is turned into a joke because of the privilege of that relationship. There are people who walk with God. Let me tell you this. I don't know if this is good to share or not. Here right now. And even if the Holy Spirit is not directing me to bless this man. And I bless him in the flesh. Because of intimacy. God will honor that word. And go and correct me later. But as far as that result is concerned. Because his name is upon my life. He will honor himself. This is why manifestations are not necessarily a proof of maturity. Because sometimes God can just defend your flesh. So that he knows that you, you know where you go and meet. And he will deal with you and say, next time you grow. That is the power and the privilege of sonship. My son. When he calls you my son, you have to call him my father too. He says, when you pray, pray to us. Our father. My source. You are my life. You are everything to me. If you don't give me life, I do not have life. If you don't give me a ministry, I don't have a ministry. And God is saying, I'm hearing the voice of a son. I'm not hearing the voice of a stranger who wants to... Use me like a ladder to climb into the life of fame and use me to do ministry. I'm seeing someone who is interested in fellowship. Let me tell you, when your fellowship dimension dies, I assure you, forget about genuine power. Are we together? Back to the scripture, please. We have to round up. My son, the next instruction, give me. Wow. That means... One thing the anointing will cost you. You will not only receive, you will give. You will have to give, give.
give up giving. My son, if you are truly my son, prove that you are my son through your giving, not money. There is something I need from you. Give me. This is what many believers do not like. When you are working with God, let me tell you, there will be a lot of give me's. Give me your Isaac. Give me your reputation, your ministry. Hand over your desires to me. Most times we think when you say, my son, receive. My son, come and take. The making of men of power in the spirit is my son. Next instruction, give me. Prove that you trust me. Abraham, take now thy son. Don't tell me you love him. I already know. Thy only son whom thou lovest. Go and offer him upon a mountain that I will show you. Can I tell you this? You will never see what in, is in God's hand until your heart, not your offering, not your singing. He didn't say, my son, give me your music. He didn't say, my son, he didn't say, my son, give me your morning devotion. He didn't even say, my son, give me your character. As wonderful as that is, I do not want those subsets. Give me everything that makes you, you. I cannot trust you till I have your heart. Because whatever is in your heart is your God. Do you know what God is saying? Look at me. My son, give me my position. That's what is meant by that scripture. My son, whatever is in your heart, if it is me, you should not be afraid of giving. Give me my position. Ah. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Only give us, sing this song. Take your place. Us. It's a song for givers. Take your place. One more time. You are the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. You are the Holy Ghost. Take your place. When you give me your heart and I capture that heart there is nothing again that can steal my place in your life so when they give you the jeep and say because terminated darkness over a family the jeep has no power over you because it when it comes to your heart it finds out that it's occupied there's no space things stay in your heart because they find it empty so he says before things get there let me, the, the heart was designed to only eyes can fit that heart. When you give you Apostle Joshua Selman, and while they clap for you, pride wants to enter your heart, but he comes and finds his majesty already seated. No room for you. Oh dear pride, no room for you. His majesty is seated there. When you have the opportunity to use the gift of the spirit and manipulate people, and collect money when that spirit of deception wants to come to your heart he finds his majesty seated when he says give me your heart is an advice if you don't give me your heart and you allow something other than me enter your heart it will tear you into pieces even if it's after 30 years in ministry it will still destroy you it's a risk to live when I am not the object of your desire is God speaking to someone here? This is why the first day they gave you the mic to lead the small fellowship. You didn't know pride was in your heart. As soon as you led that fellowship and you saw what God did, someone came to you for counseling in the evening and suddenly pride started coming. I'm not small, though. That means there's something at work in me and God said, I warned you. I warned you that soon they will start inviting you and before they invite you, do a handover ceremony. You refuse. Now look what is in your heart. Pride. Lost. Pray 
prayerlessness. All of them have found your heart. They are placed in your heart. Can I tell you this? You have to pray tonight before you get the anointing. You have to cry to his majesty and say, Lord, everything that has found its way in my heart that is not you, let it get out of my heart and give you space to come gloriously. This is the secret to authentic spiritual power. Not just impartation. No. My son, give me my place. Give me. Can you pray that prayer in one minute? Take everything, oh God, that is not you in my heart. If it's the anointing you came to receive. Oh yes, take away the pride. Take away the flesh. Take away everything that does not represent your counsel in my life. Give me your heart. Hallelujah. We're praying. Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. This is the language of those who are totally surrendered. Can I tell you this? When you give your heart to the Lord, that's not the seed for being born again. When you are saved, you receive his life according to scripture. When you give God your heart, that is the requirement for service and intimacy. When you are saved, you don't give God. I know we use it just theologically. God understands what we are saying. But in reality, when you are saved, you don't give God your heart. You receive his life. When you give God your heart, it's called surrender. That is the secret to being used by God. That's what makes you a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. Those who surrender everything to God, please keep that scripture there, get to a point where this becomes their anthem. Jesus, the yielded, said, Father, if, it, if thou be willing, remove this cup from off me. But he says, nevertheless, not my will. That means when you give God your heart, it's no longer about what you want. It's no longer about your desire. The anointing does not come up to everything you want to do with it. No, it is not my will, but your will be done. If you want me to sweep the church and that is what gives you joy, I will hand over the mic and pick a broom and sweep with honor because it is not my will. Let me tell you this, the hardest thing for a believer to do is to surrender everything to Christ. It's easy to fast. It's easy to pray. It's easy to do Bible studies. But surrender is hard. It will sting your ego. When you truly surrender, there will be nothing left again. You may have heard me say it again and again. That if the Lord tells me, son, let this be the last time you will pick this mic to preach. I stand by the God of heaven, bishop. This will be the last time I will hold a mic in my life. If God says, don't do ministry again and don't preach, it doesn't matter even if it is Donald Trump who is inviting me to speak in the White House. I tell him, I love you, sir, and I honor you. But before you came into my life, there's an authority that I have handed my all to. And since he's prohibited me from coming, I am sorry. If you are not that yielded, forget about rise up and walk and you just have someone jump. No, sir. It comes from yieldedness. Please hear this. This is the missing ingredient in the teaching on the anointing. Most times the teaching on the anointing focuses on the vessel and the impartation, not the death. But I tell you this, more than the vessel, more than the impartation, it does not take long to receive anointing. In five minutes you can receive something. Just a touch from God. Just a word to you. The real thing is that death. I've handed over my entire life, not just being born again. I tell you sincerely, ask the Lord. Not only do I love him, he has become the epicenter of my life. And we are going to pray tonight. Just that one prayer, I speak over your life and we're done. Rise up on your feet. Are you ready to pray?
Lift your voice in one minute and ask the Lord to take away from your life everything that does not represent him. Lift your voice. My son, I desire fellowship, oh God. I'm tired of just doing church. I'm tired of just doing religion. I desire genuine intimacy. I desire the anointing upon my life. But the first key is my son. Bring me to a place of intimacy where you can call me my son. Where you can call me my daughter. Bring me from afar. Draw me near. Someone is praying. Draw me near, oh God. Draw me near. Draw me near. Hallelujah. Prayer point number two is a prayer of surrender. Not only great meetings and God does all kinds of wonderful things. My phone is full of text messages. What kind of man are you? You are a spirit. You are not a human being. No people write all those kinds of things. And then I just kneel down at the side of my bed and say, Lord, may I never be deceived with the flattery of men that is written here. My heart is connected to you, ever yours, only yours. Ever yours, only yours. Ever yours, only yours. That you get to that point. I know what I'm saying. Because human beings in a bit to acknowledge the grace of God upon your life can go as far as their honor can take them to. And sometimes it can almost become like human worship. It's up to you to have the sense enough to know that there is one greater than me and unashamedly acknowledge him. And God says, you did this for me. You stood in the presence of people to let them know that you are a dead vessel without me. Let's rise to the next level. You are ready to go to the next level. I'd like you to pray. Cause pride, cause lust, cause every attribute of peace. Pay whatever price you can pay by the grace of God. Uh, because I, I trust God that I'll be doing for time's sake. Now we may not be able to do an impartation, but tomorrow I hope that we'll have the time to just speak. I thank God that I'm I'm around even up to Monday. So it's a great, it's a great thing. We have meetings upon meetings, and God is going to be helping us. But please do well to open up your heart tomorrow. But just one prayer, Father that my heart is open, I pray. Let the grace I didn't come for this service with follow me back. Let something I cannot Holy Spirit. It didn't used to be like this. You used to find time for God. The night times were times of fellowship. You look forward to everybody leaving you alone with God. But now you don't even know what has happened. Let me pray a prayer of restoration. In the name of Jesus, let there be a fresh restoration of your your value for God your value for spiritual things in the name of Jesus number two distractions there are many of us you only open your Bible when it is a corporate opening but when you are alone you want to open then you check a message then you go on YouTube then you go on your social media platforms then before you know it you are calling a friend is you need the resources that will help you to, to make way because intimacy is atmosphere dependent. Some of you, you need a room, you need a space. Some of you may need an electronic gadget that you can put messages and worship songs. Whatever must be provided in your life for the sake of your relationship with the Holy Spirit, that grace be released upon you now. <laughs> Hallelujah. For some of you, it is that you are completely not born again. You have been around the things of church, but you are not prepared to take God seriously because you suspect that being serious with God will cost you everything. And you are right. It's not a suspicion. It will cost you everything. I am praying that in this conference that the Holy Spirit will break that stony heart and bring you to a point where you love him. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, please, before I go back to sit, let me encourage us. Um, I know that see what you are doing like a retreat, like a project. Are we together now? I want to encourage us. I know it is not easy. But between tonight and tomorrow, find any of the time in the night to spend at least 30 minutes in prayer with God. Is that a deal? That means between now, from now till tomorrow. Don't just walk tomorrow and come and sit down for a church service. Put your alarm. 
can't sleep away and say you must wait. I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a revival project. Are we together now? Call certain friends and say, we always talk by that time, but I'm sorry, not for this night. Please. The Spirit of God came to help us revive our lives. Are you getting what I'm saying? So please make sure you find time. If you stay together, some of you can even do this in groups. You can just say, look, my friend, since I, I spend the night with you, we can wake up by 12 or 1. Lord, it is your presence. No longer ministry. My heart pants for you, for more of you. Let there be a restoration of that secret place. And God will be flashing to you the pictures of when you used to be together. And say, my son, come back, come back. Let's get back to the place of power. Before men knew you, before everyone knew you, it was me and you. What has suddenly distracted you? He will not condemn you, but he will draw you in love. And say, let's get back to the place of prayer. For some of you, as you open up suddenly, those visions will come back again like the hair of Samson. Those, those, those revelations you used to have will come back. I pray for a restoration of everything you have lost. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.